everybody, back again with another one of my Star Trek reviews. And before we start, I just have to formally apologize about last week's review. I was really tired, I had work the next day, and like a goofball, I just made some criticisms and observations that were literally just incorrect and inaccurate. Like, I think I criticized Tarka for not being at the main command console on Bookship when he went to go and actually activate his weapon when I didn't take the time to go actually back and watch the clip because I was so damn tired and he was totally just like at the main command console which at the same time doesn't really change my criticism a whole lot. Book, you just kind of saw this guy commandeer your ship to go and fire a volley of torpedoes by the way that was my second mistake i refer to them as i think lasers i must have not only been tired but a little bit high as well because i referred to them as lasers maybe which don't even fucking shouldn't exist on any ship at this point in the star trek timeline definitely should have been phasers commandeered book ship to go and actually fire that volley of quantum i assume quantum torpedoes at the discovery ship and you're just gonna let this guy sit at the console and let him do whatever he wants why do you trust him you really shouldn't i guess my criticism of the scene is just it lacked very good choreography i feel like a lot of scenes in this season lack a lot of good choreography they lack a little bit of budget and i think that this is going to be a reoccurring theme especially in this episode which i will get into later and then also last episode i was very critical of it just because it lacked a lot of substance okay my main criticism of discovery is that it oftentimes underuses its cast of characters and i was a little bit disappointed that the Commander Non finally returning out of the blue episode, she returned only to perform this role of an overbearing security officer looking over the shoulder of Michael Burnham the whole episode, and then at the end of the episode, she just gives this cheap message of leadership to Michael, and it's a little bit preachy, annoying, and unnecessary, and not to mean repetitive. Like, there's already been themes of Michael having to make hard decisions in the captain's chair, and what is the viewer honestly going to get out of that? Like, okay, folks, sometimes you're going to have to kill your boyfriend for the sake of the mission and for the sake of your friends and to keep the galaxy safe. Like, what? What is me as a viewer really, am I going to get out of that? That's not a lesson that I could really take home. We need a lot more lessons for the viewers and a lot less lessons for Michael Burnham because at this point, the whole leadership and command lessons that she's got to have in the captain's chair, at this point, they just need to get a little bit better because the one in the last episode with Commander Non, just in Michael Burnham's ear, just be like, you got to kill Book. You got to do it, uh, Michael Burnham. It's your responsibility as a captain to make the hard decisions. Commander Non is the one person that is not on the Discovery crew besides Tilly at this point, I'm pretty sure, that is, you know, not from this point in the timeline. This is not her home. It just seemed a little bit weird to me that she, without notifying anybody on Discovery, just slipped back into the ranks of Starfleet security. And now that she's back on Discovery, she wasn't really acting like really much of a friendly ally, but she was the asshole security officer character for the episode. Why did Commander Non have to fill that role? It could have just been any Joe Schmo. It could have just been anybody for the filler episode. I'm just a little bit disappointed pointed that they had to do Commander Non so dirty. But with all that being said, that is all the reasons why I was really critical of last episode. Let's get into this episode. Season 4, episode 10, titled Galactic Barrier. In this episode, the Discovery actually get ahead of Book and Tarka. Book and Tarka have to run a little errand, and they get ahead of the game and actually travel through the Galactic Barrier. In this episode, we have a lot, a lot of dialogue in this episode. I can see from a mile away that this is the most under-budget episode of the whole season. Season, there is just an unbelievable amount of very mid camera work. I was watching some episodes of season three today and you could honestly just tell the budgeting difference. Uh, a lot of the scenes and a lot of the camera work in the season seem really shallow. It is so much dialogue. There is so much dialogue in this episode. So many just normal pan shots, okay? There's an extreme lack of just editing camera shakes that you see in previous seasons. It's just extremely translated in this episode and that is not like an overwhelming criticism. I know this is the COVID season. I know that there was demand on them to get this season out and I also know that the budget was probably spread a little bit thin but I just have to make the comment regardless if you guys pay attention to this episode I want you guys to just look at the camera tilts the pants and then maybe go back and watch an episode from season two or early season three and tell me if I'm crazy or not. The title of this episode is very good Galactic Barrier. It's straight to the point. It's solid. It's definitely much better than naming uh, 
at least one episode for every new Star Trek series, damn Kobayashi Maru. It is very exciting to me, the idea of Trek becoming multi-galactic. It's an idea that's been slightly explored and referenced in other series and episodes, but it's never really been dished out. Never gone and stably explored another galaxy in Star Trek, at least to my knowledge. The idea Discovery is presenting with Species 10C in this multi-galactic conflict is actually pretty cool to me. I'm just hoping that they're actually saving a blunt of that budget to juice up Species 10C. I want Species 10C to be so cool, I want them to make up for literally all the negatives about this season. This episode starts off with a meeting between Nadoya of Earth, Burnham, Rillick, a new Starfleet character. I don't really remember if his rank was mentioned, but his name is Dr. Harai, and he is a specialist in astrolinguistics and xenophonology. I assume this dude is here because his role is to help with the first contact of Species 10C. All of his qualifications would lead me to believe that he would be very good in a first contact situation. He's a really cool looking character. I'm really interested in him, but the Trek movie episode said that he would be in every episode remaining of the season, and it was just a little bit underwhelming that in his introductory episode, he literally said like a couple sentences, and he didn't really stand out. If you remember in Kovic's initial introductory episode, he had that dialogue with Giorgio, which kind of solidified him as a cool proprietary badass, but with Harai, he just said a couple of things, and he just had a little bit of a nerd moment with Kovic, and that was about it. It really didn't give me much of an impression of his character. I wish we could have just got a couple extra sentences from him because he just feels like he's going to be slightly significant as a character. Go to this scene of Book and Tarka talking about how they're going to get through the galactic barrier. Tarka says that the only way to get through the galactic barrier that is kind of like obvious is that they're going to have to use programmable antimatter and they're going to have to go to some obscure place to go and obtain this. Tarka also gives us some important information. He explains explicitly how the galactic barrier works. He says that the mycelial network does not exist there so that they cannot travel through it with the mycelial network and apparently it must also cut off the mycelial network because the obvious question in my mind is why can't you just, you know, poof beyond it. When you get closer to the barrier, the energy of the barrier will literally fry both your brain and your shields, and that is bad news. Also, I'm wondering if the Kelvins are like canon still in the Alpha Quadrant. I might need to go and watch that episode of the TOS to remind myself, but in that episode, didn't the Kelvins decide to like stick behind in the Alpha Quadrant and actually make some sort of colony? I could be wrong. I don't know if they just decided to retcon that at this point because, you know, it's the TOS. Also, another thing that I need to bring up real quick is that a lot of people are criticizing that Commander Vance may have made kind of like a slight canon mistake in the last episode. He refers to traveling outside of the galaxy and he makes comments about how we've never done that before and if we've means like all of Starfleet and all of Starfleet history, that's obviously definitely wrong. Lieutenant Commander Bryce is leaving Discovery. He's actually not making the trek to Species 10C and he's not going beyond the Galactic Barrier because he is actually going to be working with Kovic to try and communicate with some way with Species 10C through the Galactic Barrier. So he's not going to go with Discovery. He's going to be back at Starfleet HQ. Saru, by the way, is so horny in this episode, and I love to see it. He is pursuing President Tarina. He is actually making some moves. He's busting the moves out on her, confessing his feelings for her, saying that what they have, their friendship, perhaps it could be more than a friendship. And I'm all here for it. I honestly think this is the cutest shit ever. Saru and President Tarina, I ship them so much. They're such a great potential relationship. Far better than Book and Burnham's. Book and Burnham's relationship just to this day annoys me and I kind of think Book might be the worst thing that has ever happened to Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek in general, but I can sit here happy knowing that Saru and Tarina are at least having a good time because uh, you could just see from a mile away these two are head over heels for each other. Adira is back from Trill this episode. It doesn't really do much this episode, just has a little bit of dialogue. You know, that normal Discovery dialogue says Grey is doing well apparently, which is good to hear, I guess. I'm just happy Adira is back, low key. Adira will have to do now that Tilly has been vaporized from the show. Tilly is seemingly never coming back and Adira, the Adili supplement replacement at this point. President Rillick and Burnham lay down parameters before the mission starts. Ah, yes. another 
Father Michael Burnham's speech to the bridge crew and the whole ship. It's kind of appropriate here because the mission is so dire and huge. It almost seems like they're going on a Zindi save the world go away mission and they actually are. The stakes get so much higher. The speech is appropriate here. I just wish she wouldn't have done it all those other unnecessary times so that this time when it's actually needed it would hit different. They pan over to the room where Dr. Harai and the other representatives are in there. There is a representative from the Ferengi Alliance? Like there's a Ferengi there and I'm just laughing so hard because of all the Alpha Quadrant species you could have brought to go meet Species 10C. Why are these motherfuckers deciding to bring a Ferengi? All the other species Species in the Alpha Quadrant seemingly regressed after the burn. Trill, um, Vulcan, like, they, they all regressed. They got xenophobic and nasty and mean. Why would the Ferengi not still love money? I agree that in Deep Space Nine they were getting reforms and they were becoming more progressive about women and stuff, but I have no reason to believe that at this point in the timeline the Ferengi would not still just absolutely, m like, love money, especially when, because with the presence of the burn, galactic smuggling and trade seems to be at an all-time high. So I just want this Ferengi to act up. That would make my heart just explode if we got to Species 10C. They were some kind of corporeal being and the Ferengi just started being really money grubbing. It would be totally hilarious and I would love to see some Ferengi greeniness in the 32nd century. It's just comical that of all the damn species they decide to bring a Ferengi. I, I definitely laughed at that. Saru's talking to Culber in the hallway when he's surprised to see that President Tarina is actually joining the mission. Culber gives Saru a great talk about the jitters and insecurities that come with initially pursuing a relationship, and it's really good but I need Culber to start feeling more like a chief medical officer than just a ship's counselor. It's really cool that he could do both, but can somebody please get COVID or a scratch on their ankle or something so I could feel like this guy is an actual doctor? The only thing that he's done this season that had any semblance of doctoring is when he pulled out his pad to that dead guy and in really comical red letters it just said dead. Tarko recounts and has a flashback this episode. This is the Tarko flashback episode that tells us all about Tarko's backstory and there is a crazy surprise twist that is just kind of cool that I admire and like about Tarka's backstory. Yeah, no, let's just get into it. I really like it. Tarka recounts and has this flashback about his infamous friend from another universe. We learn that his name is Oros and that he's an unspecified Xenos. At least I cannot specify him. If he is an already existing Trek species that you guys know about, please let me know. I don't know what he is. They're forced to look for an alternate propulsion system other than dilithium based warp after the burn. Oros and Tarka, though, get to know each other. They bond. There's this scene where Tarki even helps him fall asleep and they quickly become friends after a while. Oros is initially extremely untrusting and doesn't really want to talk to him. While Book and Tarka are arguing about flashbacks though, we cut back to the Discovery and they're way ahead of the game. They're actually at the Galactic Barrier beating Tarka and Book. And the barrier looks pretty cool. I guess it could look a little bit better. Like I said, they need a higher budget. The coolest part about the Galactic Barrier is when they actually try travel through it. That makes it look a whole lot cooler than just looking at it from afar and it just looks kind of like a nebula that's gone Super Saiyan 2. Stamets comes up with the idea to ride through the barrier using some sort of spatial bubble. When they travel through the galactic barrier, it looks very volatile and dangerous and that is very appropriate. I like it. Rillick then comes to the bridge to notify the captain that they've received a decrypted message and that on arrival they need to read it as soon as possible. Tarka and Book are approaching the workshop and they see this cloaked ship. It's a courier ship. Tarka continues having flashbacks of him saving Oros from a panic attack. He's having memories of a previous engineer dying and Oros reveals that he's working on this interdimensional transporter, which confirms Tarka's story. Oros tells Tarka that he seeks this place called Kyalis, and Kyalis is the most peaceful of all possible universal outcomes. You literally have a universe out there where Hitler probably took over Earth, didn't stop there and started taking over the whole universe and there's a whole universe controlled by Hitler. But then, on the other universal spectrum of that, you have Kyalis, where all universal outcomes are so dope that it almost seems like heaven. There exists a universe where you didn't spill your coffee on your lap on February 2nd and give you that huge second degree burn. That universe exists where your girlfriend didn't cheat on you and take the dog. It is Kyalis and we all seek it. It's actually really cool. I like that from a story perspective that there exists like a universe where all outcomes 
outcomes are really good, and I wonder what that universe would look like. I do not think that Oros is alive after watching this episode. I really would like to see Oros as a corpse by the end of the season. I feel like it would make things juicy. I feel like it would make them impactful, and I feel like it would make things dramatic. Cut back to Discovery. Message from Admiral Vance notifies Burnham and President Rillick that the DMA will affect Earth and Navarre come 71 days. So yeah, this definitely starts feeling like the Enterprise Zindi mission where they're on their way to go and save the Earth. Kind of raises the stakes in a good way. Rillick and Burnham bicker about what actions to take. Burnham says that they have to stay on course and notify the crew. Rillick doesn't want to do that because she says that this is a very, very delicate political situation. Back to Oros and Tarka though, there is a scene where Oros and Tarka are like cuddling and doing math equations, which leads me to believe it kind of is confirmed in my eyes at this point that Tarka feels this immense responsibility to get to this alternate universe to find his friend because they have some kind of romantic relationship. This is gay alien love. This is gay Xenos love. And I am all here for it. This is beautiful. I thought that there was going to be like bodies on top of bodies. There was going to be some dark, grim, dark backstory for Tarka, which would have been cool. But this is just like so discovery, isn't it? That Tarka has this gay alien boyfriend that he needs to go meet at all costs because in this universe, everything probably seems so bleak without him. I just thought it was really cool. I like that Tarka is doing all of this because of somebody that I assume he loves because Book also seemingly is doing everything he's doing to protect the people that he loves. And I just think that that's kind of a parallel that makes me feel better about the events of the last three or four episodes. I I like that. I like what's going on with Tarka and Oros. I fuck with it. Oros and Tarka attempt to escape from their laboratory, but they don't have the necessary energy. So basically, Oros gets f on. Tarka barely makes it out with his life. Tarka hides out in the woods for 10 days comes back to the facility, Oros is gone, and the only thing that is left behind is this golden ratio mark that is left in the lab, and it gives Tarka the impression that Oros has created a way to get to the other universe. And then also, previous episodes had me confused, and I always thought that Tarka was from a different universe to begin with, and he's already traveled between universes to a degree, but I guess that Tarka has always been from this universe, and he's trying to get to that one universe just to simply meet his friend there. So all this time, Tarka was burdened with love, a bond he forged with his fellow alien captor. It's beautiful, Xenos, gay love. Way better of a turn than a damn crying Kelpian. Good girl talk between Rillick and Burnham throughout this episode, especially towards the end. There's this little snippet where Burnham talks about her anger for the situation, her anger for the DMA, and their, her anger for Species 10 C and how she wants to harness it, and how she wants to like complete this mission like a total badass that she is. Also, this little scene at the end where Book ironically tells Tarka not to blame himself for leaving Oros behind, but that's just so funny and ironic to me because I still feel like this dude is blaming himself for the destruction of Quajon like every second of his life. So it's just a whole hoot having that come out of book. At the end of the episode, Discovery finally arrives at the space between galaxies, absent of stars. After their discussion, Madam President comes to the agreement that the Discovery crew must be briefed on what's actually going on and even decides to give the briefing herself after a little bit of convincing from Michael Burnham. Saru and Tarina confine each other in the last moments of the episode and join to sit around a romantic space fireplace that looks like one that you You'd find it inside of a fancy Wendy's. The ending scene between Rillick and Burnham literally looks like it's an actual jab at IRL world leaders, telling Rillick that leaders must show in times of uncertainty that they appear confident and fearless and that they must have a plan for what's coming and not to arbitrarily withhold information from people because that could end up making things worse. I think the writer's room for Discovery is literally just pissed off about COVID and the COVID political mess that occurred in the last year and a half and how it made millions and millions of people argue about waves of misinformation. But all in all, this episode was good. It was basically the Tarka backstory episode, and that's really where I got my in entertainment. But from a viewer's perspective, the episode seems like the most under-budget episode of the season. If you really pay attention to it, not a lot happens. There's a ton of dialogue, like a ton of dialogue, and a clear lack of action. And the Galactic Barrier Voyage was really like, it's sincerely like a 6 out of 10 at best. There was a courier 
ship on the planet Tarka and Book were on, but nothing came of it. It totally could have been absent from the episode and the little scene and dialogue just could have been wiped from the episode and it wouldn't have mattered. Why did they feel the need to show us cloaked vessel number 54 for three seconds on screen and have nothing come of it? it didn't make any sense. It just seemed like they wanted to supplement the boring field that they were in with a little bit of sci-fi. It was actually just kind of weird, cheap, and foolish from a viewer's perspective. I give this episode a 6.5 out of 10. For those reasons specified, I really hope they're saving the budget and juice for when they actually encroach onto Species 10C's territory. I'm so excited to see what Species 10C is. I legitimately hope that they're corporeal and that they're not just space gods. I definitely wouldn't mind if they were humanoid, but it's also just a great opportunity to create a potentially awesome and threatening new Trek species now considering that all the Alpha Quadrant baddies have now been trivialized and are just normal everyday Joe Schmoes compared to this. And at this point in the timeline, they definitely have beaten the Borg. By the time of Picard, it almost seems like that one Borg cube was what, like a museum or something? It was a research center. They've definitely learned how to deal with the Borg by now. We need an awesome new threatening species and species 10c has got to make up for what the season has been lacking but with all that being said that was my review thank you guys so much for watching also if you're wondering for the weird little cut i had to come back and record this later because my camera cut off at a weird time anything you want to share with me leave it down in the comments below i love any and all comments i literally read them all they're my favorite thing about youtube working towards a thousand subscribers i think i'm like 40 subs away when i hit it i'm gonna get a neck tattoo so if you want to see me potentially embarrass myself please be sure to hit that big red button Button. And with all that being said, I'm going to have to see you guys in the next one. Live long and prosper. Peace.